welcome back, welcome back. So for our next segment, we're going to be having a panel discussion. And for that discussion, we're going to have one of our committee members, Tam Fitzgerald, be the host of that. So we're going to be bringing Tam up, and I'll tell you a little bit about Tam. She is our international banger, so she travels the world sharing her craft with the world and, and what she enjoys, as well as she is also in the financial industry. She is a blockchain enthusiast since February 2021, which you probably just heard her giving her story a few moments ago. And so I'm excited. I'm sure you all are in for a treat as we bring Tam on up to the stage. And she's going to introduce to you the participants in this panel discussion. It's going to talk about the impacts of this technology on this Worldwide Wednesday. Hi, Tam. Hi, Natasha. Thank you so much uh, for that warm introduction. Um, as Natasha said, I'm Tam Fitzgerald. And uh, a little bit about what I do, I am an international mukbanger, which means I travel the world and I eat food and I show people my experiences. And I'm a financial advisor utilizing um, insurance tools to help people to begin their journey to financial wealth as well as tax-free retirement planning. So while I am not um, traditionally in a technical space, I found my way to, to, to the blockchain technology via Bitcoin, and it has been an amazing ride thus far. Um, I'm so excited today about the panel because I get to ask and you guys get to listen about how this technology is impacting us in the world today. The regular person like me, regular person like you, regardless what industry you're in, you will be affected. So, um, as we're bringing up our panelists, uh, we're going to let them introduce themselves, and I'm going to go ahead and start with Natalie Gill. Um, if you would, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Natalie. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I'm super happy to, you know, uh, um, to get to know uh, all the event and everything that's going on. Uh, really uh, excited to be here. And, um, you know, I think we have uh, probably similar facts in common with joining the space. Um, I start, uh, you know, I heard about uh, Bitcoin um, many years ago, but then I started th thinking that seriously. Um, when I was doing research some years ago, I uh, went back to grad school, and um, so I, I worked in financial technology, uh, you know, for years. So it was very curious about that. Um, you know, I'm a systems engineer, uh, technology architect by training. So uh, in the past years, I've been doing a lot of uh, let's call it evangelization in terms of blockchain, blockchain, pure blockchain, scale blockchain, uh, deploying on um, you know organizations, corporate. Um, uses and, and financial inclusion as well and and um, you know it's been a, it's been such a right I normally don't um, you know don't, don't do uh, crypto but I also explain about that and in the past months uh, it's been uh, great to have all wrapped up as web3 and also not only uh, the technology and crypto but also the intentions around uh, inclusion and decentralization and empower everybody the initiative I run right now is Roshana, so it's a, uh, a Web3 based platform uh, that empowers talent, diverse talent, to get to great companies. And probably I'll, I'll share a, a little bit more about that, but you know that's what I'm doing uh, right now after years in corporate, in finance, and in health tech. And super happy to be here and super humbled to have a fellow panelists talking uh, with today. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, we are so happy to have you. Uh, Brianna, Faye, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna Faye. Um, I am a metaverse architect. I'm actually formally trained as an architect, but I have been working in tech for over 10 years. And uh, I kind of have a focus in emerging technologies. So Web3 is a big part of that. Blockchain, IoT, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, which is why this year has been particularly exciting for me because uh, I think the world suddenly cares about a lot of things that I care about, which has been really delightful. 
delightful. And yeah, I specialize in, in pretty much all those things. I've been in the blockchain space for quite some time. Uh, and I, uh, the last year, dove really deep into NFTs. Um, they're kind of you know seeing the mass adoption path that we we so wanted back in 2017 and 2018. So um, yeah, delighted to be here. Uh, I, I'm a builder in the space, uh, an artist and, and a creative, and so I'm happy to talk more about all things uh, blockchain, metaverse, and the applications beyond you know a lot of what we're seeing right now, which is sort of arts and uh, PFP, profile pics, avatars, uh, but talk about the immense impact that um, NFTs and Web3 technologies will have on, on all the kinds of different industries. Wow, thank you, Brianna. I know you are going to add so much value to this conversation. Um, and next we have the wonderful Blue Moon. Go ahead and introduce yourself for us. Hi everybody, my name is Blue Moon. I'm a founding partner of Intent.Art, which is a tech, art, and sustainability forward NFT uh, artist collective and platform. I also, aside from my uh, my business in the NFT world, I am also a sustainability influencer. And recently I have been focusing my content on the intersection of blockchain and sustainability. It's been a very uh, interesting wild ride, but I'm learning a lot and I'm really dedicated to educating my audience even more about the um, the interest about blockchain and sustainability. I think that Web3 world is coming, whether environmentalists want it or not, and the more environmentalists we have, while the Web3 community is being built, the better off we're all going to be and the, the more like forward thinking sustainability wise we're also going to be. Wow, thank you, thank you, Blue Moon. Uh, just for you guys listening as well, Blue Moon is going to be uh, our final speaker today, so she has something else in store for us, so make sure you stick around, make sure you're tweeting. Um, it's a wonderful conversation that is going to it blow your mind, I guarantee. Um, <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have Melissa Rusek. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name. It is fine. Everyone butchers it. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, I am ML Ruschak. I don't go by Melissa too often. I am a, the CEO and of Trient Press, which is a publishing company traditionally publishing books, magazines, th stuff like this. But we just started transitioning, taking our books and making them into NTFs. So that's how I actually got into the space. And I was doing a podcast with a, another wonderful woman that actually taught me in 30 minutes what blockchain was. So this is how we connected and I got here today. That's pretty much what I do. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. And I got you now. Rusuk. Rusuk. Uh, I'll get it. I promise. Think rooster, roost, and chalk. Roost? Chalk. Chalk. Rusuk. Yep. Rusuk. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much, Jamil. I appreciate you ladies for being here. Um, so without further ado, let's get right into the conversation. As a regular person, right, I have a family, I have responsibilities, I have a job. Um, how can I expect my life to change or be altered by this new blockchain technology? I know it's a very broad question, but each of you guys have different specialities, so if you can, just Take it away and, and help us answer that question. How will this new technology impact my life? And if we would like, we can actually go ahead and start with uh, ML, if you don't mind. How, <laughs> how do you find it happening? I, I'm seeing a couple of different trends right now as I do a lot of research. As an author, as an entrepreneur, I research the heck out of anything before I invest. So I actually started working with uh, a platform called Gram Free. It's just so I can get my feet wet and figure out the space before I start investing money. But at the same time, I'm seeing how my money's growing using this free platform so I can transfer what I'm learning 
as an individual because I don't know blockchain. Six months ago, I you would have said Bitcoin. I would have said you're crazy. <laughs> um, but I'm seeing how to transition what I'm learning here and implement it into my not only my daily life as a person, but also as a business owner. I'm seeing the investing, I'm seeing the growth, I'm seeing the sustainability where my other investments, including stocks and Microsoft, Disney, stuff like this, isn't as, as sustainable and not as quickly income, daily income, versus what I've seen on traditional stocks. Okay, so we can expect, what you're saying, there's this investment that is going to change. Um, investments say going to change your banking's changing I'm starting as a business owner accepting Bitcoin as currency for books wow. so and I, I do I do understand like a little bit about the Bitcoin as, mm -hmm. as a currency um, and how it can how it can uh, affect the way that we are uh, transacting is there any way you can go into a little bit more <coughs> detail on that for me <laughs> it was me okay as a business owner I'm always looking at how do I grow my business well the one thing right now everyone wants to know because we have the crypto cards we all know crypto.com has their pay here with this debit card use your debit card from them or other sites do this too I just know that one's on TV a lot but pay here use it as cash well what companies are actually doing that so the day I started advertising, hey, I will take Bitcoin as payments for ebooks. Now I'm seeing growth within my company. I'm actually seeing more people buy ebooks through Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies than they are with the debit cards. I'm seeing this transition, especially with the younger uh, 20 to 18 year olds, a lot with them right now. They're paying with crypto. So it's changing me as a business owner, how I'm doing business. Now I have to make sure my bank can keep up with transferring uh, Bitcoin to USD because the banking system hasn't caught up with that completely. It's too segmented. Right. I do have a bank that helps, but it's not one-on-one -on -one yet. It's not the same. So I have to make sure everything's lined it up. Absolutely, like it's very important to make sure that throughout whatever your financial chain is, like your bank has to be on board, your pockets have to be on board, your business owner, it all has to be syn mm -hmm. synchronized together. So I can definitely see how that would uh, affect how you do business. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and ask Natalie, same question, like how do you, how have you been seeing uh, this affecting the way that we interact right now? So, so I, I think, um, um, you know, some years ago I was wondering how this is going to um, you know, be adopted. And then, um, you know, I work, I have several use cases all the way from, I have a, a great friend doing uh, tokens with bottle of wines years ago, like groundbreaking thing, IoT tracing, whatever he's doing in the wine here in Argentina. Um, a lot of other things going on in banks in Latin America. You've seen the disruption uh, caused in, in El Salvador with the you know, government-led Bitcoin adoption. But there's a lot of things that are being there uh, because of the need, right? So there are several countries around the world. I'm, I'm pretty much uh, uh, you know, uh, close to, to Latin America. And then uh, you know how, uh, let's say, um, the first thing we started to talk about uh, cryptocurrencies way back was, um, you know, remittances, payments, and everything else, right, before we went into, into more things. So, uh, you know, but there's a lot of a lot of things going on in Venezuela years from years now. Uh, you've seen the past days also a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things enabling, uh, you know, the value payments because of the war. In Argentina, there's a lot of things going on because of regu regulatory stuff. So, um, you know, on the finance side and then evolving to a DeFi side, there's a lot of opportunity because there was a leap. Uh, so right now, most of the systems are, you don't need to cash out. We can encapsulate that in a case that is 100% digital because a lot of people, they have access to digitalization. And even like years ago, you know, telcos, 
they provided balances so you can trade with those, like for 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 uh, daily uh, transactions. So it's there, it's there. There's several uh, initiatives on the finance side. But I also think uh, opening, um, you know, um, the things around uh, NFTs that open the space to more things. To, you know, we on top of, of uh, the, the adoption that is generating right now. The adoption caused by stress is one because there's a need to figure out how to pay, how to receive. The other thing is, you know, the more organic adoption on, you know, uh, looking for, for alternatives to what we are doing right now. Uh, in, in particular, um, you know, because I come from finance, I hope we stick to that, but now I'm shifting to talent. And, and uh, you know, probably for an everyday person, there will be more ways to, to generate value. Uh, I'll stop there, and then probably we talk about DAOs and talk about, you know, remote work, and we talk about payments all over the world. Something like mine, but I think uh, right now you can see that. The one last thing, sorry, I, I, uh, <laughs> I think it's longer. There's a lot of things on blockchain that we're using right now that we don't know we're using, by the way. Additional web two companies. They're using blockchain on, uh, you know, um, there's uh, several ports connected uh, to customs. We don't know who you heard. I heard Amazon is one of the ones that's been using it. I know everybody has Amazon. Listen, they get about six hundred dollars out of me. <laughs> you don't know. Probably if you use like your cell phone, you don't know all the unless you're like a super detailed architect. You don't know all the list of things you're using. But I'm pretty sure I'm using blockchain at some point. I don't know. Right, so, so before before we move on um, from you now, I did want to ask you, you said the term DeFi, and there might be somebody here listening that doesn't exactly know what you meant by DeFi, so can you just uh, give us a quick definition of what DeFi is and, and how that how you're saying it's going to affect the space? Yeah, I'll try to summarize quickly, but you know, most of the finance is being centralized by, even by governments or um, institutions that have a lot of power, so, um, um, you know, banks, finally, right, or, or whatever, um, from, from a bank it is. But if you put um, together, and, and this is a concept that right now has a name, but it's been around, like, if, you know, to work together to, to generate value, it's been around for a long time already. But right now, it's more traceable, easier to, to implement with uh, blockchain crypto and everything else. So the idea there is to have, um, you know, not only the banks providing services, but people, um, you know, peers, and providing support like for loans. I don't know, if you want to put together a loan, you can have a lot of people that put it together the loan for you and then, you know, there's several rules that are, you know, they are uh, fair for everybody and not for centralized and this is what is called asymmetric information, right? You have decentralization and then what gets the value is the central organization. But in this case, the, the incentives are that everything is for everybody participating, providing or receiving the service or, or whatever we're doing. It's a longer explanation for DeFi, but it, I, I like it better <laughs> that way. Right, so, so, what, so what I hear you saying is that in the future, I won't have to go to a centralized place like a bank to receive a loan. I could essentially ask my peers who are on the blockchain network to support whatever I never whatever never I have via the blockchain technology and moving currency that way and they would basically fund my loan. Uh, in the future hopefully but we are gonna be hybrid for a long time. Just to yeah, 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 but, yeah for a long time but this is um, this is a path in which we can take the blockchain technology. I think that's very cool because exactly what you said is sometimes in the centralized um, financial industry, certain people get treated certain ways and there's like, you know, all this all this research you can do and figure out and like how it's been utilized to oppress people and all kinds of other things. But the idea that it will no longer you there's a possibility that, that we won't have to go to those same institutions that are known for these types of things and we'll have more options is an amazing um, idea to me. Um, so we're going to go ahead and the, my next question um, I have actually is it may be I believe that uh, Blue or um, 
Lou and Brianna, I think you guys would probably get to answer this question. So maybe we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about how Amazon is using blockchain. Do either of you can can talk to that a little bit more about specifically how Amazon might be using the blockchain? I think that I mean I think that um, it could have something to do with supply chain uh, verification, but it's news to me. I am actually really curious to hear more about how Amazon is using the blockchain. Actually, Amazon's yeah, using um, using the blockchain trajectory, and I I think that for, for folks that are newer to the space, it's it's important to know what big players are doing in the Web two world. So that's like Web two is the existing, you know. Uh, internet companies, I guess you call them, or companies that use um, Web2 principles. So Web3 is everything related to blockchain, AI, um, kind of like the, the newer cutting edge things that will apply to everything in the future. And um, yeah, so I don't, I don't personally know how Amazon's deploying it, but I imagine Amazon, just like every other uh, Web2 company that exists right now, is thinking and trying to think figure out. They're figuring out how they can get in there. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And, they, and they should be because, you know, they're basically dinosaurs at the, the top of their mark these days and they're trying to prevent the ultimate, you know, outcome, which is if they're not preparing themselves to uh, build upon and accept and, and also forward these new technologies, they will soon, you know, see themselves drifting off of the, the world's leading companies in the next uh, 20, 30 years. Excellent. Okay, so I just want to say real quick, I'm taking some notes. So I hope that anybody here is listening, you're taking notes. So it might look like, you know, I'm jotting things because I actually am. I'm taking notes. Like I said, this conversation is for me and people like me, and this is a good time for you to make sure that you are writing down things that you want to know about, going and doing more research on them, um, finding how you can connect with these ladies. We'll talk about that a little bit later um, in the Discord. Make sure that you're checking that out. Um, to, to further ask more questions. So personally, I'm taking some notes, okay? So um, my next question is, uh, what does decentralization mean to you? Because we hear the term decentralized, centralized. What do these terms mean to you? Uh, Blue. Well, with the decentralization, you know, we don't have a group at the top who's like pulling the strings for everybody. Just like how you were saying with you know, certain people not being able to get loans or having to jump through extra hoops for loans. With decentralization, it's the same process for everybody. And then there, we are also avoiding situations, let's say in the banking industry, like what we're seeing in Ukraine today, which is people lining up at the ATM so that they can take out their cash because they're worried that the centralized bank is going to limit how much money they can take out of their own accounts or that their bank cards aren't going to be working at all. And if we have a decentralized system, there isn't like one entity that can control all of that for everybody. So to me, it means uh, more equal access. And I think that is really important when we're talking about bringing in diverse groups. And when we bring in diverse groups and diverse groups thrive, everybody thrives. You know, uh, it, it, it's like at, at, at its base, at its core, human rights issue. Absolutely. Um, and how about you, Brianna? What does decentralization mean for you? So, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think also pointing to, you know, the situations going on in the world right now with uh, regards to Ukraine and Canada as well. Uh, the importance of kind of distributed and non-centralized ownership of things, we, we can start to understand the importance of how quickly things can change. So um, centralization means to me that you know it is completely uh, decentralized. It's basically completely owned by the network. And to operate truly decentralized is, is very difficult, actually. I think there's only like a few good examples that I know of of uh, what we call DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, what we see a lot is kind of a buzzword. Um, so we see decentralized and DAOs um, thrown around a lot, but most organizations aren't really truly operating like a DAO. Um, a great example for anyone who's following the NFT space of, of a properly executed DAO is the, the Nouns project. So they basically launch um, uh, an NFT every day for auction, um, and basically when you buy one, you're now in this 
DAO. And if you own one, you have one vote. And then the voting system that they've actually built, which is all transparent, meaning you don't have to be in the club that you can see who votes on what. Um, so it basically keeps the submit ideas. And if you have one now, you get to you get one vote on how you think um, money should be used, what initiatives should be submitted. So they're building skate parks for kids around the world. I mean, they're they're deciding to build you know software tools. They're deciding to donate money, um, and and basically all of the money that's raised from people buying these things goes into this treasury. But then they get to decide what to do with it. And it's kind of a it's a big project funded by some OGs in the crypto and NFT space. So um, you know, nouns. I don't know what they go for like as of this week, but you know they've gone from I remember from 40 ETH to hundred and some ETH each. So you can imagine that since they're launching one of these every day, that, that treasury gets very big very fast. Uh, probably probably four months in now. So yeah, then and then they as a DAO get to decide, okay, what do we do with this money that we've all spent, right? And how do we want to deploy it? Do we want to build a business? Do we want to donate it? So that's a really good example for anyone who's interested in like a concrete, tangible demonstration of decentralized principles in an organization. Um, it's a really great example. And, and again, you can kind of see everything according to their voting mechanisms on, on their website. So it's it's very concrete for anyone who has a hard time kind of wrapping their minds around, like, how does this work? And it's, it's, it's very simple, but it's, it's coded. And that's what's nice because, you know, decentralization is good in principle, but if you're relying on, you know, kind of handshakes to do it, a lot of times it ends up being um, semi-centralized. Right. So I'm hearing that there is an opportunity here to really, you get to choose how your money, how your funds will be used, what projects or what initiatives are important to you, and you make sure that you are part of an organization that is really going to use your funds to do that. And I know in the past with some organizations that we have right now, there's been like all kinds of news stories and articles about how there's been misappropriation of funds by certain, um, you know, uh, like different groups that are environmentalist groups, whatever, all these groups that, that claim to be using the funds to do whatever, and it turns out that they're doing something totally different. But from what I'm understanding, you're saying that a DAO, and this particular DAO is, is a way to, that we'll be using this technology now to really make our dollars count, really put it where we want it to go, if that makes right. sense. Okay. And, and because, um, you know, the technology itself, the blockchain technology is inherently mostly decentralized. It's actually not all decentralized. It's, it depends, again, on, on the way it was crafted and the owners and, and all of that. Um, but, you know, say everyone does exactly what they said they'd do, you know, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum network is decentralized, and um, but the thing is, people can use that technology, which is decentralized, in centralized manners. So even though the, the you know the technology of blockchain itself, which for uh, unless it's been described in a previous thing, it's basically a continuous record of transactions happening, right? And it, it can be monetary. We talk a lot about financial, but it can also be you know with NFTs, they can be other kind of data storage and transactions happening. With those. So it's basically this ledger of all of these things, and um, that is transparency, right? That allows for people to understand where things are going and why. So a lot of people actually get caught when they do bad things on the blockchain. Um, it doesn't necessarily go to jail. I think one day it, it'll be a lot easier for the government to kind of catch up. And uh, But yeah, like it's very easy, and there's sort of, it, within the communities, there's this sort of self um, governance to say, hey, I'm looking at your wallet, I'm seeing where the money is moving and how much, and that's not right. And people have lost jobs because of it, people have, you know, uh, been, been caught. So it's it's very uh, interesting to see, you know, how um, transparency and decentralization plays, and then also how human factor, which, you know, we have our own little spin that we like to put on things to actually use and execute on the technology. Um, can, can distort that. So you, you might, just because you hear decentralization or just because you hear DAO, it does not mean automatically that, you know, it's operating as such. Wow. 
Okay, I'm actually going to let, um, you know, and also now that I also want both you guys to uh, answer that question for me. So, what does decentralization mean to you, ML? Uh, actually, decentralization, I, mean, I look at it from a completely different point of view, would be, hey, I can take my whatever cryptocurrency, either whatever, I can pay my authors that are in Australia, what I can pay my authors in the UK, is all the same currency. So, me as a business owner, I'm actually paying less fees, and I can show that to my investors, hey, I'm actually saving you money by doing it this way than just going to the bank and going, okay, and now I have all these fees, this is what you're investing, why you're investing your ROI is less now than it was three months ago. This is how I'm seeing it, because I'm, it's going there. This is banking. Banking 101 says you have to keep up with the times or you die, basically. So this is where I see this is going. Uh, so basically, you have one currency essentially where mm -hmm. you can pay everybody in the same type of currency, not worrying about um, the fees associated with paying them mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. That's 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 pretty revolutionary, I think, for businesses, um, especially when you're doing international business. Um, I know that those fees can be very high, and as a result, some people tend to lose out on their funds that they could have in their pocket. Exactly. You know, utilize. So if I. Yeah. Absolutely. As an example, if I'm sending USD to Australia, I'm paying five to seven extra extra dollars just to send that money over there. If I send it through Bitcoin, I'm paying what thirty cents, maybe. Right. It, it's a lot. Right. E it's a lot easier and less expensive for me to send a Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency, whatever they have in the wallet, than it is for me to send USD. And that's either through the bank, through PayPal, Cash App, whatever way businesses are transferring money overseas. Wow. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay. And last, go ahead and answer for us, Natalie. How and what does it, decentralization mean to you? I agree with all the things, so I won't repeat uh, that in terms of what means on, on, on technical and, and on the, let's say, uh, all the concepts and also culture we are creating right now, right, on top of, of, of all the ecosystem. But, um, you know, whenever I explain, um, whenever I explain to, let's say, corporations, it's more about uh, cutting intermediaries, right? So we have intermediaries right now, uh, centralization in governments, because we are relying when we are voting or, or whatever we do with, uh, with the people in the government to, to make, uh, you know, all the public policies and everything we need to be, uh, to have a consensus, right? So we are relying on several layers of things and then we get back whatever regulation or whatever services, public services. So there's a lot of intermediation there. Same with companies, right? We buy something here, and it came from somewhere else, so there's like a hundred intermediaries. So, but we don't know a lot of, trans we don't have a lot of transparency there, right? Because it's centralized, and it's also, there's what, what I called before, the asymmetry of information, so we don't, I don't know really if I'm paying one dollar, but it really costs if I'm doing, and I have the transparency, all the intermediaries kill, um, not on the, on the on the chain, probably I'll pay 10 cents, whatever. So so that's one part, right? And and this is more, not, nothing to do with technical things. This asymmetry of information is actually an, an economic term. So it's more about these dynamics and these things. This is number one. And number two is, um, yeah, about intermediation, uh, we still need some people to provide guidance let's say, who's scoring uh, or putting together about, right? Like, okay, we need at least one, two, five people, because then the governments, if we want to have consensus or we want to have everything, it could be a pain, too, if we need to agree, like, you know, everybody needs to agree. So there's six, I think in the past years there's been a lot of progress on the governance part, uh, uh, you know, supported by all the tools and, and technical things we have, but also in the way we organize. Uh, so that's why, since, you know, I agree with all the things that you, you said before, and then also that, you know, there's some part of centralization that we have all the time, and then we're paying for that, 
basically. Um, and and that's something that, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, DeFi and everything, and I put this example, right? Whenever I, I take an Uber or whatever service, my willingness to pay because I need to get the, the right pass, so I pay more, uh, the, 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 the person uh, giving me the right, they receive a little bit more, but I don't know what's behind that. Who's maximizing the incentives and the value of that? Uber or whatever company is in the middle. We don't get the best of that. So to decentralize that is also to decentralize incentives. But the thing is, in central decentralization, we are also more empowered, so we have more responsibility. Ooh, wow, we're going to definitely get into that, absolutely, because I know that there's some hazards with this decentralization. But before we do that, um, two things. Uh, we actually have live, since we're live right now, we have the chat. Um, if, you're, if you're streaming from our website, it's on the right-hand side, and we are going to answer some questions. So feel free to pop in your questions there in the chat. And we actually have um, one question that we're going to bring in, and before, before we do that, we have um, one of uh, another panelist that's going to join us, and we're going to give her opportunity to introduce herself. Um, Bouquet, uh, if she's ready to come on, we'll let her in and uh, allow her the opportunity to introduce herself, and then we're going to get to this audience question. And who gets ready? Okay. Um, actually, we're going to go ahead and go to the. We're having a little more technical, technical issues today. So we're going to go ahead and get to the, um, the audience question. The audience question is this, ladies. Um, what does D-Y-O-R mean to you? Do your own research. What does that mean to you? And feel free, whoever wants to go ahead and start. Well, I advocate this a lot. I will talk crypto to my I turn blue but at the same time I'm always say you have to research I'm an author so me doing research is second nature to me if you're not comfortable investing a hundred dollars okay start with ten go to cash app does crypto so you can get your feet wet using a small little app with ten dollars or Go to your free apps, learn what the space is. Do, if you're gonna invest in a stock market, okay, regular stock market, you research what the stock does, what's the trends, where it is, how much should we pay. Everything you have to do, you have to research it. You have to be mindful of where you're putting money and then remember that you have money there so you can actually watch it and know when to pull it out or keep it there. You have to learn the market, but you also have to learn where to put the money. Don't just trust someone you, you meet on Facebook, Instagram, what all, whatever thing else. Oh, I'm in blockchain. Give me a thousand dollars and I invested for it. Don't start there. If it doesn't feel right, don't start there. <laughs> start doing it yourself and then work up. All right. That would kind of. That kind of goes back to that decentralization piece and what I was speaking to that we have a lot of responsibility in this space. Like you have to get your feet wet and do it yourself. Um, and you also touched a little bit on the, the last part of the question I see here is it's and can big tech be trusted partners? Um, Blue, go ahead. Uh, for the question on can big tech be trusted partners, I don't know. I mean, I feel like they have their chance and they kind of blew it. And now we have our chance. You know, in Web3, the big difference between Web2 and Web3, in Web2, we can create content. In Web3, we own it. And we also can own the platforms. You know, a lot of what we've seen in the Web3 space, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We haven't even really arrived yet. And so I would really love to see what happens when not big tech uh, comes in to uh, to help build out a space where we are like co-owning it, co-stewarding the, the platforms that we are functioning on. Some people say that big tech cannot be trusted partners because they have already shown us that we can't trust them. And why trust them when there are other people who are saying that they can do it better? Um, including all of our uh, ourselves, if we're like co-owning a platform, just like in real life, when people co-own a, a thing, like let's say a co-op or something in real life, it's going to be managed better 
than if it is owned by somebody who's like a centralized entity that is located far away. Um, so I would be really interested to see how um, Web3 gets built out without um, big tech. Uh, and if, but if people are also going to trust new emerging platforms that are not controlled by big tech. Because another trend that I'm seeing too is that when people see a big brand behind something, including a, a big tech name, they're kind of like flocking to that thing because we are attracted to what is familiar to us. I think there's also going to have to be a trend of of trying something new and trusting new people, and that's going to take a lot of trial and error. It's um, yeah, lots of uh, uh, lots of unknowns. Uh, but to me, that's one of the things that's really exciting about the space is that. Uh, we're all building it together, and we don't really quite know what it's going to be yet. However, I think the success of it is going to depend a lot on our individual involvement, our group involvement, to build out something that is really going to benefit society as a whole. Wow, thanks, Lord. I, I think to, to, to what you were saying, like, the fact that there is, that you're going to have so many new people that are going to be offering and that have, that have done the research and are coming to this space and then offering other people goods and services or however they're, they're, they're interacting with the space, I think that comes back to the question of what does do your research mean, right? Like you have to you have to get in front of it and you have to be a steward of this, this yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 and then also just to kind of touch on like what does do your own research mean to me, I think you know, I, I, I wish that what I had been told when I first started is to just like go really slowly and take in a way more information than, than you want. You know, when you feel like it's too much information, then maybe at that point you're ready to invest. Um, there were some lessons that I had to learn the hard way. But um, yeah, and then just to kind of, you know, let's say big, the big tech question. Um, if they're willing to come in and play by our rules, which are decentralization, community, and transparency, then I think maybe they can, can like, we can play ball, you know? But if they're not willing to abide by those values, I think there are people who are going to be able to do it better. And a really good example is, let's say, storytelling in the, in the media. The mainstream media, which you know, is controlled by a small group of people, these producers and directors who've been around forever and are really calling the shots, and also writers who are telling the same stories over and over again, um, and like, kind of like slowly, like brainwashing us to view society in a really certain way, which is how we see, like, let's say tropes and how women are presented, for example. In Web3, and where there's more community involvement, and where holders are being able to t call the shots and write the script of their own story, we're going to see stories that are more, um, more interesting and more fleshed out characters, and maybe stories that are even better for society to hear, and certainly more creative content. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that idea. <laughs> um, Natalie, Brianna, would you like to touch on that for us? What does uh, Do Your Own Research mean for you? And can big tech be trusted partners? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone has, has expressed it really eloquently already. Um, it's so, so important for, for anyone that's new in the space. Um, if you're like wanting to really dive in, don't do it blindly. Um, get Go to the places where people are talking about these things. You can learn a lot from YouTube tutorials. You can go on Twitter and follow a bunch of um, really intelligent people in the space who will actually like answer questions and point you to resources. Um, now, if you don't wanna you know, go in like all in in terms of diving in deep and you don't wanna spend 40 hours researching about NFTs, crypto, um, all that kind of stuff, then again, really only risk um, what you can completely afford to lose uh, that you wouldn't even bat an eyelash uh, because it is a very volatile market. And even if you, you've been in this space for a long time, veterans lose money too, they, they have bad bets. So um, whether it's from a collecting art phase or uh, you know buying Bitcoin or whether you're in finance and you're wanting to trade or you're just collecting NFTs, if, if it's anything monetary at all, just make sure that you are, and, and do your own research can mean different things depending on what you're actually getting into. So for, for you know, 
Binance, it's more like looking at the token that they bought. You, this is very similar. Look at the teams behind it. Um, what have they launched before? Are they trusted? Are they doxxed? Meaning, like, do we know their true identities? Um, what have they done before? Have they done other projects that you know they they left behind? Um, that's a big you know red flag. And do you want to invest in something that they're doing now? Uh, so it's just really important to do that research um, to help you know. Uh, less bridges be burned, I guess, and, and by bridges I mean things in your wallet, because it is very easy to it is very easy to lose things in your wallet, and it's also very easy for the things in your wallet to lose value. So um, if you want to try to avoid those things, which I highly recommend, it's kind of kind of across the board. I think anyone in crypto is like trying to do those two things across the board. You you really have to either spend time or just be willing to risk more. Because it's, it's very easy to get scammed. It's very easy um, for for teams to just go away, and um, also for things to get stolen. Because you know, when true decentralization, it means that you're a steward of your own assets. So when, when they you know if they get hacked, there's there's no bank that's going to you know protect or refund you. So in the same way that your money's sitting in a bank and you have some you know on paper at least some protection of up to a certain amount, you know, if someone does. Uh, a fraud check, you get that money back. Uh, there's nothing like that in, in blockchain. So you're you're just the will of yourself and what you've learned and the best practices that you've implemented. Uh, absolutely, thank you, Brianna. Like it is it, is a very very <laughs> important thing that you said there when you said that about how you. Are risking things and it's very easy to lose things in your wallet like and how important that that ties into what you know about what you're going into and of course that circles back to doing your own research um, Natalie go ahead so I have um, a, a position here is David uh, advocates you, you know what happened um, probably 20 years ago and so uh, with open source which we still have some type of decentralization, but everything is centralized when you go to GitHub or, or some place to, to consume code or some or places. But I, I, right, I think right now uh, corporations, big tech, already play the part. If you see, uh, there's a lot of contributions from the community, and there have been, but the ecosystem was built by in the past in the past years, in the last years. Um, you know, the top com organizations that were contributed at the very beginning were universities, as you know, because they were students of these universities. But right now, top contributors are Google and Microsoft to open source. So they play the part. Of course, they want to be con connect their things that are corporate, that, you know, but to or whatever, to the ecosystem. Uh, so I think at some point, they're going to manage to play the part not to be like, okay, this is centralization and we're going to play the part of, of uh, extracting all the value that I have and cannibalizing whatever. Uh, but at some point, I think they have the resources to do things. So if they figure out how to play the part on, you know, let the centralization happen and all the technology be there, I'm pretty sure they can release, um, you know, products and services that are completely decentralized and they can, you know, because right now we're centralized, like, we can be 100% decentralized, no, you know, we we go to internet to the route, like, half of the routers and, and telecommunications equipments are either Cisco or some other brand, so we are centralized at the end because we run all the concert. and then we go all the way up, so we are going to be hybrid, I don't know, forever, but we're going to do that. So I think uh, big techs, they, right now I'm not not really happy on what, for instance, Facebook is doing with uh, <laughs> calling metaverse and meta and whatever, and then, you know, uh, companies as Microsoft and, and, uh, and Amazon uh, having this completely managed blockchain, like you can just deploy in 10 seconds, uh, because this is not really like this. Decentralized blockchain, right? It's decentralized on their cloud, so you have like layers of their right? So anyway, I think they they will start to to figure out how to play the part, how to empower of what you know everybody's doing, and that'll be. They did it with open source. I think I expect that to happen uh, there because yeah, otherwise they'll be you know off. Uh, so. <laughs> 
Right. So, so we, so kind of going back to what Lou was saying, like we, we're gonna expect them to play by our rules in this space, like you know, and that's probably the best that based on their history, it's probably if they can come to us correct, like I, I like you might say, you know, my my friends come correct, you know, or don't come at all. Like, you know, so that's what we can look for. And if, the, if these big tech companies can really step up to the plate in that way, then we can see about, like, you know, trusting as partners. And I, and I think that's a great idea. Um, so we're going to go ahead and now we're going to bring Bouquet actually up to the stage. She's going to join our panel. Come on in, Bouquet. Hi. Hi. Go ahead and introduce yourself oh, for I'm us. Here. Um, <laughs> You pronounce my name perfectly, and um, my name is Bouquet, um, and uh, I'm the founder and uh, creator of House of Queens. I started, I got into NFTs like last year, and I was learning. I'm a designer, I live, I'm based in New York, and uh, I've been designing for diamond companies over a decade now, so my NFT journey started a little bit like uh, about like investing in NFTs as a collector and as I get into it I really saw the potential and the you know the people the community and the especially with the woman that there was like I saw like many powerful house women they were supporting each other which was like so inspiring and so and like I feel like I'm learning every day to allow allow the, the space between where I am and where I want to go, and so it was inspiration for me. So I started this project like uh, four or five months ago, and it's growing. And and, and my collection is about empowering women. And I was like uh, for a long time I was thinking how I can empower women, how I can help them. So. Also, I'm very passionate about art and music. And you know, like uh, as an artist, I want to inspire and teach other people to how they can create and uh, like basically produce their own art. So I collaborate. Uh, I actually partner up with this company called Trapexar, which is a uh, like DJ platform and music production platform. And uh, we will be teaching our holders how they can uh, create their own music NFTs and their own production, music production, and they will be able to uh, uh, DJ Metaverse. And so I'm super excited about that. And we will be actually launching today, and which is like so exciting. Super exciting. Well, <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Super exciting. Here uh, from California, like um, basically yesterday, and I've been there for uh, over. Like, I was visiting my family for almost six months because New York is a little bit crazy right now. So I took a break, went to you know spend time with my family during the pandemic. So I'm back to my normal schedule now. I'm getting used to it. So okay. yeah, of course. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Bouquet, for, for joining us. Okay, so now we're going to take it back to that question uh, that kind of came up for me when Natalie we were speaking about decentralization. So we hear a lot in the space about money scams and how people have gotten scammed out of monies by, you know, trying to invest in this token. But I know that there are other, other hazards in this space. I'm not going to call them scams, but there's other hazards in this space. So... Can you ladies expound on either some of the money scams or some of the other and some of the other hazards that you found um, in this space? And whoever wants to go first, just go ahead. I might go ahead, Blue. Yeah, I think when it comes to money stuff, um, in some ways there has been a trade-off between us and the traditional finance world, where you know we give them their mo our money and they're investing it for themselves. But in return, we get the security of knowing that that it's good. it should be there when we want it to be there, right? Um, and so in the, the decentralized finance world and crypto world, we don't get that anymore. We are our own bank. And that is something that's really important for people to understand, that when we hold all of our money, we, it's like a high-risk, high-reward situation. We can invest it ourselves and we can get the returns that previously were only available to the traditional finance world, 
But on the other hand, we have to protect our assets very carefully, and it's so easy to lose them. I mean, I see stories all the time about people getting scammed, and there's also a lot of stories about people who just like forgot their seed phrase and are not able to access their assets anymore. That those are risks that we didn't have to take when the banks were in charge of our money. But we all, but also this system wasn't really working for us 100% either. So either way, there's a trade-off there. Those are some some risks financially. Another risk that I'm kind of worried about, though, is a lack of censorship in the space. When everything is decentralized and there isn't, you know, um, like a centralized entity that is saying that, like, you can say this and, uh, and you can say that, or like these kinds of images are appropriate and these kinds of images are inappropriate, that is something that I see as kind of a hazard in the space potentially, where you know there are some, uh, there is some some messaging and images that are very harmful and in with a lack of censorship and lack of centralization uh, we could see those you know living out in the open where they could do harm and yeah that's one thing I'm a little bit worried about Wow absolutely so yeah I think that's very important that that our own we, you, you are responsible but it does open the door to the, the, the other side of that which is you are responsible <laughs> you know uh, Natalie go ahead since you're the one that, that sparked the, con the question in my head for me go ahead and answer that for me what other hazards are there in this space the other thing that I've seen so so two things right one is the technical side which um, you know I you know, I'm a technical person, I can read code, I can write code, I can do, I can review contracts, I can trace, you know, addresses, I can review things, but then probably there are some things that I'm not an expert on, a lot. <laughs> so, um, so uh, you know, you, you really need to rely on your own technical or your organizations or your community technical, you know, uh, expertise to be safe. Well, that's something that we really need to to see like um, how to mitigate those risks, right? Because even if I, you know, on, 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 I had a wallet um, one day, I was doing some things like some few dollars, right? So I was, you know, clicking here and there and, and making experiments. And then the wallet went through zero. So it was a hot wallet, right? Uh, I did have $40. And then, so I was experimenting. Of course, I have my other stuff, you know, some, something with a ledger and everything, you know, to say, but, then I said, I did nothing wrong, like for sure, according to me. And I was reviewing things, what I was signing and everything. So I said, this is this is extremely dangerous, right? So on that side, the technical side is, I mean, uh, we and then we can, we don't have, uh, right now there's audits going on and everything, so there's peer-to-peer -peer interaction to keep us safe. But that's something that it's, uh, you know, every, every everybody's seen some, uh, rap pool or whatever, you know, there's other things of that. The other part is that, you know, whenever we have one of these scams, we cannot get uh, the police involved, which is centralized or, or government or, or judge or whatever, right? Uh, so there's there's been some more, some uh, some uh, conciliation efforts on blockchain for a long time already, you know, to reconcile whatever disagreements we can have. Um, but the thing is, it, right now, uh, and I had these conversations in the past weeks. What if a DAO fails? You know, we need a counterpart that could be legally established. What should we establish? A non-profit, a for-profit, or whatever? Like, do we really need to do that? I don't know. So, uh, you know, whenever we step to the to the old world and we need money to pay rent and or we need somebody to defend us, that's we we don't need really need to get there. But at some point. You, you know, we need some order support system to do that. So there's risks, there's regulations, there's legal stuff uh, that we are not, right now we're experimenting. And then, you know, whatever country we are, we get this regulation and then all our funds are off or nothing what we, we did is valid. So uh, it, it's, it's complicated. And, it's, and, and let me tell you this. I worked with regulators before. I asked questions to them. I, well, I didn't lobby, but I sat with them and then they said, what you know? We, they run a lot of simulations and a lot of things to, to let people be and to be protected. Some of them, of course, they have their own agenda. Some more, they're really they have really good intentions and they are very technical and they really want to do things right. But to do things right, they need to break things. 
yeah, so it's what, 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 what they need to do. So it's, it's, it's very difficult for us to, to win this war and trying to make things better to rely on people that really have good intentions, others that they don't have good intentions, for sure, right? They want to maximize whatever they're doing. So that's, that's the thing right now. We're exploring where's the intersection of, of things. And I'm pretty sure that we are overseeing something right now that has gone up first after. I don't know what. <laughs> so that's what's going to happen. And yeah, I'm probably everybody, oh, yeah. everybody uh, having a MetaMask, they have something at the I mean, I read people and everything, so. Right. Uh, Buket, go ahead and answer that for me. Like, what has this, like, maybe from the NFT side, have you have you been seeing at, with your interaction on this in this space? Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, I'm sorry, go, go, I'm sorry. sorry. Buket, yeah, Buket, go ahead. Yeah, uh, for me, when I got into NFTs, actually, uh, I experienced scam, and I, I really told, like, it was, like, actually, with my passion project. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Uh, when I got into NFTs, and uh, I live in New York, and my friends are mostly involved in NFT projects, and they're running their own. But you know, like when I was like getting into it, they were like, you know, mostly they told me like it's their male, so they told me it's male around the male uh, dominated space. It's like so hard to get in as a woman to space. I was like. Okay, I'm just gonna go experiment by myself. And first thing I, I was like, okay, I'm I picked a project, it seemed like great, and I was like, okay, I love the art, even if it doesn't work, I I'm okay to use this as a PFP. But I ac accidentally minted from the actually different projects. It was like scam and um, first experience was like scam I I got scam but and also I felt like really bad because I told I did my research. I did my you know like all the things I have to do. I, I made a list what I have to check. I checked everything. It seemed like okay, but it's so uh, in NFTs it's a little bit like I think harder because in crypto space I actually probably most of the time like uh, it's hard to not to get scammed. But if you so if you did I, I, actually everyone has to do their own research, but. First experience was I got a little bit scared. I was like, really, I tried to be more careful, and and actually, yeah, that part was like a little bit scary. But uh, as I learned, uh, yeah, in NFT space, it's so like uh, hard to find the right projects. Like uh, actually, uh, easy to find right projects, but not easy to get find their own on OpenSea, basically. Right, so I hear what you're saying is that like even with some due diligence, you were still like you know scammed, and so there's still <laughs> there's a hazard that even with your own research, you could still fall into a scam trap. So how important it is to understand that everybody in this space is growing, and how everybody in this space is learning, and how there's still viable products out there or or opportunities out there. Just because one didn't go well doesn't mean you should stop. Uh, and just understand that even sometimes when you do research, you can still be scammed. And this this whole space right now is still very much uh, has the potential to be a hazardous space. So thank you so much for that, Bouquet. Um, thank you. Go ahead, Brianna. Uh, what about you? Have you what? I know you have had to have seen some. You've been in this for a while. So what hazards have you seen in this space? I've pretty much seen them all. Uh, <laughs> after you start diving into the Web three space. Um, you either by proxy see them happen to your friends, people you know, um, or yourself. Um, and that again is why it's so important to iterate. And again, this is this is not this is like the stock market on steroids if you're treating it from an investment point of view. So every dime that you put in should be money that you can totally walk away from and not bat an eyelash. And even uh, even though when the numbers go up, you're like you will miss that. <laughs> it's, uh, what I'm saying is though, it's very likely to get scammed. And so like, you know, it's kind of like riding a bike, you know, uh, you, you fall once and then you get back on the bike and you start learning uh, better, right? So you definitely do research, uh, but you also want to just uh, kind of accept it. Like if it happens, just 
accept it, learn from the mistake, don't make that mistake ever again. Um, so yeah, some of some examples that I've seen, um, uh, definitely ones we've referenced in the NFT space, uh, the pet reference. So you you can basically um, sign things. So for those of you that are in the NFT space and have like MetaMask wallet or something comparable, um, you're asked to authorize uh, transactions and. and by that you need to sign and authorize things. There are malicious things, so like you could be going to mint an NFT project, which actually has a malicious, um, you know, basically line of code in the contract that uh, says secretly, um, hey, I'm going to now take access to your wallet and be able to drink funds. That's really fun. So you're going to buy something and then all of your money disappears. Um, well, I've heard several people mention hot wallet. So there's, there's hot wallets and Cold wallets, or cold wallets, also referred to as as um, hardware wallets. So that's like an extra security mechanism. I won't go into detail because, again, that could be like a whole talk on its own. But um, hot wallet is much more susceptible to um, scams because uh, a hardware wallet, a cold wallet, basically adds a layer of protection where you need to type in a code on a physical device to authorize a transaction. But again, we just talked about how you can actually give authorization without knowing it, right? So a hardware wallet's not the end all be all. And that hardware wallet has a password, which you can also lose. Uh, <laughs> and so like, these are all things that, you know, if you've heard of the kind of memes around voting accidents in crypto, like that's kind of one of those, um, it's an expression for that. So if someone had a hardware wallet with all their crypto on it or a portion of it, and you know they lost it in a voting accident, maybe went overboard. But again, that could just be like you literally lost it. You could lost it, uh, lose it traveling. Um, and there are you know backup mechanisms. So a, a very brief you know run through is usually you want multiple hardware wallets, uh, multiple hot wallets, and you want three copies of every uh, wallet's phrase, seed phrase, which is the kind of like the password, the ultimate password to recover it. And then those three copies need to be in different places and have their different security measures and you should never share them with anyone. But again, maybe you know, maybe you, you teeter on that and you say, well actually like I have a, a, a safe with my family because it needs to be kept safe from me losing it. <laughs> or or in the event of you know something happening to someone. I, I think about that a lot. A lot of people say never share your seed phrase ever. And it's like I actually put an asterisk on that because there's a lot of people that, you know, anything can happen at any moment. And do you, you know, does someone that you really trust have access to um, your funds because something happens to you and you're not able to communicate, you know, um, what happens to all that money, right? So I think it's, it's very important to, um, once you become more ingrained in this and, and the deeper you dive, to really educate yourself on these best practices and communicate with, you know, with people who are, you know, maybe close to you, um, maybe it's, it's even like a lawyer, for example. Um, and basically, yeah, put these best practices into place because I've, I've seen them all and um, you just carry on. So there's a good thing about uh, crypto, we, we always hear the saying, you're, you're here early because we still, it doesn't feel early still, but it still is, uh, especially in regards to the, the mass adoption that's just been um, insane this, this year, this past year. I never, I never saw NFTs as being the mechanism to propel us into mass adoption, but it happened, and that's delightful. I'm very pleased about that. But yeah, uh, that, so we are, we are still early when we talk about global mass adoption. Um, so you know, if you lose everything. I've personally had you know assets that where you, you leave money on an exchange and you forget about it and um, you won't that much money, but then suddenly, like three years later, it's a lot and and that exchange goes down or that exchange gets hacked. So again, these are all the, these are why these understanding what's centralized, what's decentralized is so important because you might think you're, you know, by moving my money into this exchange, it's safe. It's like, it's not. That, that exchange is not going to bat for you. Um, you have, who's the team that even runs that? It's your, your funds are not protected. So if that exchange, which is kind of like a bank in itself, if they get hacked, your funds are susceptible. Maybe your funds are actually hacked. Maybe your funds weren't hacked, but they freeze all the accounts and you can't touch it. Maybe the founders of that project actually just close the website and take all the money and run, right? And they, they kind of um, had a 
have ways to prepare, you know, for that. So there's all these different ways that can happen. Just know that it's never like a hundred percent safe, you know, in any <laughs> in any like place you put it. But that's why it's important to try and you know uh, kind of keep everything in different uh, places and also with best practices. Absolutely. That was some great golden nuggets. I hope guys are out here taking notes. Uh, ML, last, you're going to be, you're going to round this out, and then we're going to go to a quick intermission after that. So what other hazards have you seen, like maybe from a business owner side uh, in the space? Before I started doing NFTs for the eBooks, my I was discussing with my daughter because my daughter's more tech savvy than I am. She's younger generation, you know. So she's like, mom, you don't want to go into NFTs right now because everyone's getting their stuff stolen. Well, me, books, books are pirated every day. It doesn't matter if it's an NFT or an ebook regularly. So that doesn't change anything, but at the same time it adds in the NFT world a little bit more protection, but not really. They can pirate the cover they can pirate the download and resell it, whatever. But at the same time, it happens every day. So I wasn't seeing it as a risk. On the flip side, then you have all these people that get a hold of you on LinkedIn, Shaper, all of their networking sites, not just the regular social media. You have to use this Bitcoin. You have to use this NFT site. You have to, you have to be mindful of what they're telling you and do you research that works for you because otherwise you don't know who these people are especially if they're just randomly getting a hold of you they could be scammers they could be legitimate you have to be mindful of what you're doing at all times absolutely so thank you guys so much stick around with us we're going to go to a quick intermission and we'll be right back Right, so yeah, great conversation, great insights and perspectives on a lot of different topics in the blockchain ecosystem, and we will be continuing the conversation right after this quick intermission. Uh, 
there we go. Sorry, I was, I was muted. Uh, thank you so much, Tasha. Um, so the next, the final question I actually have is, this is going to be another one that's for everybody um, to kind of close out our conversation here. I really want to ask each and every one of you, because you are involved in this space in different ways, what is your vision for the future of this space? What do you hope to see in the future? Um, we'll go ahead and start with you, Bukit.
We also have verifiable proof of ownership through blockchain technology, and that's going to make some things really uh, streamlined if we're able to adopt them in a, in a safe way, in a sustainable way. And so things like, you know, passports, medical records, birth certificates, and all of this stuff can be saved on the blockchain. And, um, you know, when it's permanently stored, you don't have to worry about like, oh my God, you know, like I, there's a meme where like, you know, you're just going about your daily life and it's like, oh my God, I don't know where my social security card is, you know? <laughs> In the future, on, on blockchain, we won't have to worry about that because we, it will be stored on, you know, a theoretically a, a private wallet with all of these important documents that are um, that are, are specifically tied to your identity. So there are implications for that too. So for example, when you when let's say immigration, for example, where you need like verifiable documents, um, this will be provided on the blockchain. Your your immunization records, for example, will be verified on the blockchain. I can't tell I, I don't even know how many vac like new vaccine cards I've had. Um, and so you know, there's there's a lot of potential for streamlining information like that. Another thing that I think is really important to note is sustainability through blockchain technology. One way to tackle this is through uh, supply chain verification. And this is also a way for us to make sure that the things that we are consuming are also ethically produced. So um, there's some really exciting things, you know, in, in my vision for the future in blockchain, and I can't wait to see them come to fruition in the best way possible with no uh, negative consequences whatsoever. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Blue. I love the fact that you brought in, like, there's, there's a there's going to be hopefully a way for us to hang on to important documents, because I'm one of those people that's why I laugh so hard. I'm guilty of being like, some, where's my where's my social security card? Oh my God, I have no idea where it's at this very moment. Like, you know, but that technology being able to help me in my memory, um, that technology also being able to change the way that we interact with our environment and making sure that we are being responsible and making sure that we're sustaining this planet is a huge impact. And I hate that we didn't get a chance to get into it today, but we got more Wednesdays ahead and hopefully we'll have you back. Um, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more deeper discussion about that. Um, ML, go ahead and let us know, what is your vision for the future of the space? Well, there's a lot of open doors right now. It's going to be interesting in the next five to ten years to see actually which doors stay open and which ones that get closed. It's going to depend on how much we allow the governments to get into the regulation or not regulating. It's going to see how corporations if they play by the rules that we set or if they take control because we have to have a big brother watching over things you know this is the mindset it's going to be very interesting on how things play out but at the same time I'm anxious to have where I don't have to have my birth certificate passport all these paper products laying around that I lose constantly that I'm always having to have resent to me. I'm one of those people, I probably have 20 birth certificates laying around because I've lost them in the last six months. But at the they same- They expensive. <laughs> they do! When you're paying, you know, astronomical fees for a piece of paper, let's be honest, is a piece of paper with a stamp on it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense when I can store it on the computer and just say, oh, here's my phone, just scan it or here's, you know, whatever, just scan it, and it's the same thing as a piece of paper. At the same time, I love my paper books, so we'll see where this goes. Absolutely, ML, thank you so much. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of paper books too, I have to say that. <laughs> like, I like to flip a page, but this technology will, will yeah. make it so that even though I like flipping the pages, when those pages are worn, I can still access that book, and so that's a good idea as well. Yeah, like to marry the two. Up. So you, with your <laughs> pa two. paper book, you still get the ebook or the NFT version of the ebook. Right, absolutely. That is wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, go ahead, Brianna. Let us know what is your vision for this future of this space. Yeah, I think there's some great pictures that have been painted thus far, and um, I'll speak a little bit, maybe towards the metaverse, since that hasn't been such a topic. But how how all these technologies will kind of converge in the future, and and how we 
kind of see that playing out. But, um, you know, of course, I think built on blockchain tech, which we'll see more products, enhanced user experience, which is going to be crucial to safety, security, and also just um, onboarding, you know, new people. It's, uh, for anyone who's dabbled in the space, you, you can probably know firsthand that it's very hard, like it's very complex. And I remember trying to buy Bitcoin back in 2012, so believe me, it was worse. But um, it's gonna it's gonna improve. And um, in terms of like the metaverse ecosystem, so I think that we really are moving towards the direction of having a three-dimensional, um, more three-dimensional internet. And um, so you might see in the future that in the way that we absorb our internet content today is very like much like a newspaper. And I think in the future, people will look back and be like, wow, I can't believe they like read newspapers on their screens for so long. Like for 20 years, they read newspapers on the screen. Um, so we'll, we'll start to see more three-dimensionality and um, also bridging of digital and physical experience. So uh, hardware obviously is a big part of that. So virtual reality hardware, but augmented reality is probably going to be the first mechanism that really starts to bridge our digital and physical environments more and more. Um, as soon as the, the first kind of hardware is developed that, again, like NFTs, starts to become um, mass adopted, that will, that will really change things. And then when you have, you know, um, blockchain integrated into, into all these things, you, you have these mechanisms for um, play to earn, learn to earn, you know, everything that was once centralized, which big tech, big data, you know, basically taking your data, similar to the banks, how they're taking your money and they're, they're holding it, but they're actually making money off of all of our money in the bank. Uh, big tech is the same way, but they're harvesting your data and then they're selling off your data to the highest bidder. So when things are more decentralized, you realize that like, Facebook and Instagram and all these big players, they're only valuable if people use them, right? They're only valuable because of the content that we provide. And so I, we're gonna transition more into this really being paid for content that you deliver. And Web2 companies, like some have started to do that, you know, Snapchat, TikTok, they pay creators, um, YouTube pays percentage of ads, but we're gonna start seeing the centralized models of that work really well and the second one of those gets adopted, it's going to be enormous and it's going to completely shutter everything else because why would you spend three hours scrolling on Instagram when you could be making thousands of dollars for the content that you're being provided on another platform that's decentralized? And your, fa your, your fans, your friends, your family, whoever it is could actually be contributing to that. So it's almost like this hybrid model of like, Patreon, if anyone's heard of Patreon, coming together with, you know, your social media like Twitter or Instagram, um, and also Etsy, right? So it's like, think of something that actually encapsulates all those things, and it's not just a marketplace, it's just the place that you go, and everything can be transacted, uh, but it's also social. So it can be monetary, it can be e-commerce, we'll call it, but it's also your social experience. It can also be a game that you play. So that's the power of three-dimensionality, because when you have an avatar that's running around, we think of it as a video game, but it's also a social experience when you're playing with, you know, like us six in a room right now, you're having a virtual experience. So imagine if we were in a three-dimensional world where like, you can also be like, oh cool, what's in her wallet? Oh, that's for sale. I want to buy her art right now, right? Like on this screen, you could, so think of those kind of things and, you know, death be to Zoom and, <laughs> Web to centralized data extraction, and hopefully it'll be more distributed to the people that are really providing the value on the platforms. I absolutely love that. As a content creator myself, who like you know is is kind of struggling to kind of break into that and getting the into these different creator funds, whatever they're calling them, like it. And I know I have people in my community that support me. I know I have people around me that support me. It's going to be so cool to be able to be the you're supporting directly me right like you're not supporting facebook plus me or whoever else plus me it's just me and i think that that is a great way like you said to build that community and i also think that the augmentation like that we're going to start seeing and how more of this web3 space is going to be uh put into our daily lives in the in the, the 3d world or whatever it's going to be 
amazing. Like, I, I cannot wait to see what this space is going to offer, and I love that vision as well. And then finally, last but certainly not least, Natalie, go ahead and share what your vision is for the future of this space with us. So I, I want to add on top of all the wonderful things uh, everybody shared on this panel about, um, you know, open opportunities, inclusion, different ways to collaborate and to get the best of value. But uh, the only thing that I, I think it's real is that uh, as any org that it's been uh, growing and adopting, it has up and downs. So right now, I, I think actually we have a, a bubble that's gonna burst. Um, and that's not something that, you know, I'm a systems engineer, so I see systems, systems are not technical systems, are systems in general, right? And and, and we, we gotta expect that, uh, regardless if we have a very well built uh, a project and everything, and all the scam that is going on, and you know, things that are built on top of you know, nothing or something, but that we where where we see value, right? So we understood already the value of blockchain, you know, but proof of stake, proof of work, we can talk about that like for for a long time uh, in terms of crypto, sorry, and, and blockchain. Um, but but the, and the and, and for blockchain, you know, uh, consensus or whatever is built on top of that, but and transparency and whatever value it provides. But then the other thing is, um, you know, uh, we took hundreds of thousands of years to accept some things but for the value it has and uh, and I think right now probably you know they're going up and down in terms of value but uh, but they're going up and down right uh, oil uh, art um, let's say uh, <laughs> gold whatever so we, we need to expect that and we need to be not because we I want to prevent I mean, I'm, I'm pushing people to get to, to the space, right? It, not only on NFTs, but on DeFi, on any or a lot of other projects. But we need we need to be sure that uh, we, you know we think on the longer term, right? But that that we see like we we need to keep pushing, evangelizing that there's gonna be things uh, happening, that there's gonna be bubbles that are gonna burst, and that pro probably we're gonna be affected. But we need to see this big picture and to keep that on the long run. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, probably I flip some NFTs. I'm not on the NFT space at all. I'm just a, a, a pure consumer. I put some things here and there. Uh, you know, I don't have had a lot of time to research. That was pure luck, really. I've seen projects that I love, that I invest and in, uh, some time to, you know, uh, do promotion. There is some models that I just bought that, and then it went all the way up to five, six, eight, eight, eight. I don't know. So uh, there's some part of art, there's some part of analysis, and there's some part like myself being a systems engineer to see what's going on. So I just wanted to add that because that's, that's the real thing, it's not because I'm, I'm a party pooper and I'm gonna say it and it's gonna turn real, but uh, you know, we need, to, we need to see the big picture. That happened with the internet 20 something years ago, that's gonna happen, but you know, we need to rely on the longer term because we are doing good things. Uh, by having this panel, by talking, by evangelizing, by generating those spaces for inclusion, those three spaces, and to generate the value for everybody. But we need to expect some some things up and down, ups and down. So that's what it is. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's keep pushing. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you. Kent. Thank you, Blue Moon, and thank you, ML, guys, for, for providing so much value today. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming out and educating me. I got my notes, and I'll be back here next Wednesday uh, with another Worldwide Web3 Wednesday, but we'll continue the conversation on how we are being impacted by this blockchain technology. Thank you, ladies, again, um, and be sure to connect with each of our speakers in our Discord. And at this time, we're going to go ahead and pass it on to Lavina, our host. And thank you guys again so much. Y'all have a good one. Thank you.